to continue their series in uh, our study of Romans chapters 9 to 11. We're already in chapter 11. And we know that Paul has opened chapter 11 with a big question. Has God rejected Israel? And repeatedly you've been hearing this question for several Sundays now. And <laughs> to put it more directly, the question is, has God failed in his promises to Israel? And we've already known the emphatic response of the Apostle Paul in this. And he said, may it never be. No, he said. God has not rejected Israel. God has not failed in his promises to his people. In fact, he said, I am an exhibit A. I am a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrew, a tribe of, uh, uh, a, a member of the, the tribe of Benjamin. But God, in his mercy, saved me. I am now the apostle to the Gentiles. I preach the gospel to the Gentiles. I am a Jewish Christian who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the first half of verse 2, chapter, okay, we're in chapter 11, he said, God foreknew Israel. He chose in advance to set his love on Israel. Before the foundation of the world, he has already set his love on Israel, but not literally on all of them. He chose a remnant for himself. And you know what? That includes us Gentiles whom he has chosen to save us for a purpose. And then Paul goes further explaining in the next verses, he said, look around you. There are Jewish Christians around you and all over the world as well as other parts of the Christian world. And so God is a remnant for himself. He hasn't forgotten his promises. He hasn't forgotten his people. And this is true to you as well. That's why we said, God is faithful. He will fulfill all his promises there in the Bible. You are where you are now. I am where I am now because of God himself, because of his grace. And today, once more, Paul continues or will pursue that argument. We stop at verse 5, we study verses 6 to 10. Now in verse 6, he paused for a moment and said, I want to make this clear. All those remnants have been saved by the grace of God. Not by their own works. And then in verse 7, it's a brief summary of chapters 9 and 10. And in verses 8 to 10, as he has done in the previous chapters, he backs up. Verse 7, giving proof and referring to the scriptures to say that this argument, I did not make up this argument. I never dreamt of this the night before and then I would say this. No. In fact, verse 7 is saying is all aligned with all of God's word. And with that as introduction, may I request everyone to please rise and let us read our passage responsibly. Verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Verse 7. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes to see not, and eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, "Let their table become a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block and a retribution to them." Verse ten: Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forever. May God add blessing to the reading of His word. You may be seated. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus our Savior and Lord. And I pray that you would not blind our eyes, but that you would open them to see the truth in your word and rejoice in them, obey them, and be transformed by them. Above all, grant that we would see Christ and his gospel and embrace it in him. Empower me. We start prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want you to uh, let us look back at verse, verse 5 to refresh our memory. It says, in the same way then, 
there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Just as God worked through a remnant that He sovereignly preserved on that day, so in our day, brothers and sisters in Christ, He sovereignly chooses to save some to set, it, to set them apart for His purpose. So if it happens that you're a part of God's remnant, then you look at the person beside you, you have a remnant, which I pray that we all are, you cannot take pride in yourself of your wise choice of God or that God has chosen you. Rather, you can boast in God because He chose you by His grace. Amen. And lest we miss the point, Paul pauses in verse 6 to drive it home again. One more time. <coughs> I'm sure umay na kayo, but you know, God has a purpose in repeating this, this truth over and over again. Our self has been trained uh, to rely on ourselves every time. Every time. That even in salvation, we think that we can do it on our own, but by our own, that by our own works, by our own righteousness, to have a personal relationship with God. But it's, it doesn't work that way. And there are three things that I want to share with you this morning. One is in verse 6. Again, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. In some ways, we may see that it is not, verse 6 seems to be not essential to the flow of Paul's argument. But Paul says it. He felt the need to support his argument with verse 6, the nature of explaining grace. Because we have a built-in inclination towards self and works rather than grace. I want you to notice with me that Paul doesn't contrast works and faith, but works and grace. Now, works refers to anything that we can do in and of ourselves. If we have the ability on our own free will to believe in Christ, then we sinful people are capable of doing it on our own. But that turns faith into works in which we can boast. If God chose us because He foresaw that we would believe by our own free will, then He didn't choose us according to His grace, but on the basis of something that we would do. Did you get that? In other words, again, if salvation is a joint effort between you and God, Grace is no longer grace. Our works, you know, also flow from God's grace. But God's grace is not caused by something that we do. Because God alone is the source of it. Salvation is by grace alone. And it is not caused by something in us or something that we do. And as far as Paul is concerned, when we stress that grace alone, we are, all, we are not just engaging in a theological discussion. He is stressing the right, that we are right there at the truth of Christian faith. That works and grace cannot be mixed together in the matter of standing right before God, in the matter of salvation, in the matter of justification. You can go by the grace of God or you can try to get to heaven on your own and settle your sins with God by yourself. But I've got a bad news for you. Your works won't work. Your works won't work. In heaven, it's either by the grace of God as His gift to you in faith or by faith, wholly apart from the things that you do or you don't go at all. We don't get to heaven at all. Period. There's nothing and no one between that. No one can purchase your salvation apart from Jesus Christ. Because who else died for you? Who else died to save you? 
not even the saints whom you, you used to bow down to. I put emphasis on this for a couple of reasons, mixing works and grace. First, to mix works and grace is to misunderstand the necessity of God's divine favor. If we include works as a source of our salvation, as a means of our salvation, as part of our salvation, then we are robbing God of His glory. And we are emphasizing, shifting the emphasis from what God has done to what we have done. And we're suggesting that God loved us because we loved Him first. And that He showed grace to us because we reached out to Him first. But that is the exact opposite message of the Scripture. God the Father, while we were yet ungodly, while we were still in love with this world, while we still enjoyed the pleasures of sin and darkness, sent His Son to die for us. To draw us to Himself. We love Him now because the Apostle Paul John says, He first loved us. He made the first move and showed it to us. So mixing works and grace in salvation undercuts the consistency of the biblical emphasis on the nature of grace. This truth is all over the scriptures from cover to cover. Secondly, when we suggest that our works need to be added to Jesus' work in order to be right before God, we are belittling the work of Jesus Christ. Salvation by grace cannot be met, cannot be mixed with works because of the perfection of Christ's work. While our works are not, they are always tainted by sin because we are sinful people. We are saved by God's grace alone, by His favor alone, through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. For us to say, brothers and sisters in Christ, my friends, that we need to mix our works with grace in order to be saved, we are suggesting that the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is not enough. It is not good enough. It is insufficient. It lacks perfection. And you know what? The Heavenly Father is offended by that. Do you remember what he said to his son? This is my son whom I am pleased. Listen to him. And so we must emphatically refuse to mix grace and works in salvation. If any part of salvation is your doing or my doing, then grace is no longer grace. Amen? Second, we see in verses 7 to 10. The problem with this, with this well, you see, is that it sought righteousness before God based on their works, based on uh, believing or doing the Ten Commandments, the laws. Now look at the first half of verse 7. What is Israel seeking? What is Israel seeking? But they did not obtain it. It was a right standing before God. Or righteousness of God. You see, for the most part, the Jews did not lack sincerity. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were hypocrites. But most of the Jews are sincere in their dedication to their religion. Nor did they lack commitment. They followed the prescribed rituals and laws, you know, with so much dedication that would put most of us to shame. Nor did they lack zeal. Remember the Apostle Paul before he became a Christian? Saul of Tarsus. He went to great lengths to keep the Jewish religion pure by eliminating those whom he saw as threats, those whom he saw as uh, would be, would, would dirty the pure, the, the, the pure Jewish religion, the heretics. 
But if your religious sincerity, your commitment, and your zeal are misguided, you know what will happen? They will just move you toward judgment at a greater speed. The problem Paul explained, brothers and sisters in Christ, what there was that their zeal was not in accordance to the scriptures, the truth of scripture, especially the atonement of Christ for our sins. They did not know that Christ was sufficient and enough. The final lamb of God that he was a perfect sacrifice for our sins. They didn't know that salvation is by grace alone and not by works. And so they did not obtain right standing with God that they were seeking. Now, I want you to look at several truths. First, if you seek righteousness based on your works, you have not judged your pride which is the root sin. You have overlooked your own pride. The good works route is always wrong because it is always tainted with pride. It tells you that you're better than others, which makes you feel good. And no, this makes religion dangerous. Many people think that if they do religion, if they attend church regularly, if they give, if they serve, if they uh, help the poor, give to the, give to charity, they think that they will earn a ticket to heaven. You see, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, the one who started the Protestant Reformation, thought that joining the monastery, treating his body harshly, confessing his sins, going to mass every day, would help him to be right with God, to stand right with God. But those things didn't bring peace to his soul. Why? Because he was negating the grace of God. He pursued salvation by works. And that could be very burdensome to such a person because he's always guilt-ridden. It's a hard life to be filled with secret shame and guilt to always put up a front that you're a-okay and pretend that everything is good and clean. To come to God for grace means that I come as a sinner and there is no other way. I deserve his judgment. I don't deserve to be saved. That is to come to God in grace. But you come to God by works, you are saying, you claim I am good enough for heaven. I work hard for it. I sacrifice a lot for it. And I deserve to be in heaven. That is arrogance. That person doesn't understand the absolute holiness of God and his own sinfulness. You see, it's not a surprise that Jesus Christ Describe the, the scribes and the Pharisees with obnoxious words like fools, blind guides, whitewashed tomb, beautiful on the outside, but on the inside full of dead bones of men, brood of vipers, snakes. He even called them uh, full of hypocrisy and wickedness. He even told them, woe to you seven times in Matthew. As Jesus told them that everything that you do is done for men to see. But God sees the heart. God sees your heart. He knows you from the inside out. And pride is the root of all sin. It is a form of sin of Eve. Eve that he ate the fruit so that he could be, should, he could be like God according to the serpent. To come to God for grace. We must judge our pride until we, real we realize what it is like to be poor in spirit. We will never see the kingdom of God. To attempt to come to God by works on the basis of your works is to feel, be filled with the terrible sin of pride, just like the Pharisees. And now we come to the scary part, this truth. If you seek righteousness based 
on your works, God will harden you against the truth and bring you to ultimate judgment. That we see in verse 8. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. Those are quoted in uh, Isaiah 29.10, Deuteronomy 29.4. And it also reflects Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, where God is speaking to the prophet. He says, render the hearts of these people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. You know, this text is very important that the Lord Jesus Christ cites it again in Matthew chapter 13, in John chapter 12, and the Apostle Paul to the <laughs> resistant Jews in Acts 28. It refers to God's judicial hardening of the Jews who had heard so much truth and seen so many demonstrations of God's love and power, but refused to submit to him. Remember the, the, the two million Jews, almost two million Jews who were in Exodus, who left Egypt? They saw all these plagues. They saw all those miracles of God. But how many of them entered in? I hope you recall the verses in chapter 1 when God said, God gave them over three times. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 2 and 4. Moses said to all Israel, after 40 years in the wilderness, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and all his servants and all his land, the great trials which your eyes have seen, those great signs and wonders, yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. So even as far back as Moses, Israel came under judicial hardening from God. And it can be seen against their grumbling, against continual grumbling against God and their refusal to submit to Him. And later they followed the evil ways, the uh, idolatrous ways of the colonized, and they even intermarried. And finally, God gave them over into captivity. Remember Babylon, remember Nebuchadnezzar. But even after some time, they were restored, having been restored to the land, they tried to approach God by their works in a pharisaical way. So that they hated the Savior when he came and convicted them of self-righteousness and pride. And so that in Paul's day, listen, so that in Paul's day, the nation that had crucified our Savior came under even increasing hardening of their hearts from God that has lasted for 2,000 years now. The frightening words of the Jewish mouth who were screaming for Jesus and crucify him, crucify him, have come true. Matthew 27, 25 reads, His blood shall be on us and on our children. That's what they said. There are two ways by which we need to understand this judgment where God hardened their hearts, hearts so that they would understand the gospel. I'm indebted to John Piper for this. First, from God's perspective, he is free to act according to his own counsel, for his own glory, and is not obligated to any creature. As we saw in Romans chapter 9, verse 18, remember that? So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is not constrained. He is not constrained by anything outside of himself. Listen, if he chose to condemn the entire human race without providing a savior, he would be free 
and perfectly just to do so. May I repeat that? If God would condemn the entire human race without providing a Savior, He would be free and perfectly just to do so. He already did that. To whom? The fallen angels. They were not given a chance to repent. Are you with me? Thank you for the one who said yes. <laughs> Second, God's hardening of the Jews was punishment for their sins. God did it as retribution to them in verse 9 because of their disobedient hard hearts in verse 21, chapter 10, and unbelief in verse 20. Israel had been given much light, but they stubbornly refused to respond to it. Now listen. So God said, in effect, if you don't want to see, I'll confirm to you that choice. Be blind. If you don't want to hear, be deaf. How terrifying it is to have God pronounce those judgments against us, against you. And it stems in the case of these Jews and other religious people who seek to be righteous with God by their own works. Now, we can only uh, briefly at, uh, look at the specifics of this judgment on the life of those who turn from the light and guide that they have been uh, given. What, or in short, what are the characteristics of those who are under this judicial hardening of the heart? What are the characteristics? First, you will be spiritually dull and insensitive, unable to perceive and understand spiritual truth. Remember, God gave them a spirit of stupor. This refers to someone who is half asleep. Tignan nyo ngayon yung katabi, half asleep. Or who has been stunned so that he can think properly. Remember, we have, we have tried for several times, I'm sure, that he shared the gospel, right? To people. But they just couldn't grasp its essence. However, however simple you make it to them. We do it like talking to children, remember? But they just couldn't get it. They show us gestures that they can't understand. They're not interested. They couldn't comprehend it. Blind eyes. Deaf ears. Second, your blessings will become a curse. That's the meaning of the quote in Psalm 69, verse 22. Allow me to read that. Let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. A table should be a place of nourishment and blessing. But David prays that it will become a snare for his enemies. God gives us many blessings, many favors. Even unbelievers, material possessions, food, shelter, basically food, shelter, clothing, the joy of married life, family, children, right? But if unbelievers do not honor the Lord God, and harden their hearts and not give thanks to him, then their foolish hearts will be darkened. And these blessings will become a curse to them to keep them away from the supreme joy of knowing God. They would enjoy the pleasures of this world, the possessions and everything. But in so doing, they will never experience the joy of salvation. The joy of knowing God. Our God is the all-sufficient God. Can this material things, this Montero, this Subaru, this everything, can this suffice your joy? King. God. And third, you are headed for ultimate and final judgment. Verse 10, 
Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. The last word forever may be translated continually in light of chapter 11, verses 25, 26. But it may also refer to God's permanent judgment that will come on the reprobate because they turned away from the light that they had been given. Bend their backs may look at the bondage to the law. You see, the Jews wanted to establish their own righteousness by the works of the law. So they are consigned to the burden and, and futile pursuit, a futile pursuit of that righteousness. But that righteousness should come from the grace of God alone, through faith alone. Psalm 69 is a messianic psalm. And so these judgments are ultimately aimed not at David's enemies, but the enemies of Christ. You see, if you say that you need works to be saved, you are an enemy of Christ. If you say that you can only be justified by works and grace, you are an enemy of the cross. And you insult all the sacrifices of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Any scheme of salvation that doesn't center on the cross. Brothers and sisters in Christ exalts proud sinners. And you know what? They spit on the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who gave himself to redeem those who are under the curse of the law. And that's us now. Now the question is, how can you know whether you've been chosen by God? Does this really bother you? Has God chosen you or not? Pakitignan nga ulit yung katabi, may tatakbasan ko. And that's the last part in verse 7. Important truth. If you have been chosen by God, you will hear, you will understand and believe the gospel so that you are righteous before God through faith in Christ alone. Those who were chosen, that phrase is literally the election. Paul could have said, those who believe obtained it, which would be true. He could also say, the elect obtained it. That could also be true. But he used a different word, a different phrase, meaning the election. A word that serves to put special emphasis on the action of God as that which is altogether determinative of the existence of the world. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, explains that the word Paul used emphasizes the one who elects rather than any choice made by the people and so all the glory is to be given to God alone. So the believing remnant Jews and Gentile believers cannot boast in their faith if they have be that, that they have believed on their own decision or because of their superior intelligence, they accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. No, rather God had every right to condemn us for all our sins, for our sins. But in his mercy, he chose to save us. In his mercy, by his grace, he chose to save us. Now, how can you know that you are an elect? The result of God's choosing us is that we have heard, understood, and believed the gospel which provides right standing with God as his undeserved care. How has the gospel, gospel affected your life? Are you still wallowing in sin? Or are you keeping short accounts of your sin? Are you still enjoying it? approving of your sins. You alone know the answer to that. But how can anyone know if he's elect? It's very simple. Those who are chosen believe the gospel and walk in righteousness with him. And I say you walk in righteousness as you read his word. You are being transformed. You are growing in holiness. Not perfect, okay? Not sinless perfection. But you're going, growing in holiness. That's the direction of your life. Being transformed. Loving Him. Loving His Word. Obeying Him. Are you an elect? 
Only the elect knows the joy of salvation that humbles him before a holy God in worship and wholehearted service. Remember what I said last Sunday? The joy of salvation in you will always find outward expression of gestures of praise and thanksgiving in ways that obviously proclaim that Jesus is Lord of your life. The elect, brothers and sisters, serves the Lord. We are saved to serve. We are saved to worship. If anything of merit in you costs God's favor, then grace is no longer grace. Paul is saying that God, brothers and sisters in Christ, that God's grace Cause your blind eyes, your deaf ears to be opened so that you understood the gospel. That His grace caused your heart to respond, to believe in the gospel. And God gave you a right standing with Him. And so He gets all the glory. And when he draws you and me to himself to believe him, to embrace him, to love him, to treasure him, to trust him, brothers and sisters in Christ, all the more it becomes, all, all the more that we should be humble, the most kind, the most patient, the most loving, the most courageous people on earth. God made us his own. Only by his grace. And when he passes over others and leaves them to become hard, unbelieving, rebellious people, he does them no injustice. May I repeat that? And when he passes over others and leaves them to become hard, unbelieving, Rebellious people, he does no injustice to them. We are deserving of judgment as they, but it is only undeserved grace that we stand justified in faith. You see, verse 7, Paul did not explain this. He didn't even defend it except for those quotations. He just says, what Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? If so, if so, it's because you were appointed to eternal life by God's sovereign election before the foundation. But if not, if you haven't received him as Savior and Lord of your life, don't delay. If you reject the light that God has given you, you may come under his frightful judgment, judicial hardening of the heart. Remember? Be blind, be there. When you ask the person beside you, what us our loving Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we bow before you and thank you for that amazing grace that has been shown to us in Jesus Christ. Grant that we should acknowledge your sovereignty in it, the freeness of your grace and take comfort in assurance. I just pray if there is anybody here who hasn't accepted you as the Lord and Savior of his life, would you please open the eyes of his heart that he would see himself as a sinner? Away from you, running in fact away from you, and that he would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And I pray, Lord, for the members of this church, those who are also attending this church who have accepted you, I pray that they will see in themselves growing in the faith, maturing in their walk with you, 
I pray that they would see themselves serving you. And if not, Lord, I pray that this would be a challenge to them. That they would be a part, Lord, of the different ministries that you have given to us. As we, Lord, reach out to the neighboring communities and campuses around this place. Thank you. This is our prayer, Jesus.